Hey everyone, my name is Octavia. Uh, welcome to the Prelude Community Discord. Um, for those who are tuning in for the first time, um, we ha kind of have like a special event here. We invite InfoSec uh, professionals and people that are InfoSec adjacent to come and speak on a topic once a week. Um, this week, we're looking at designing ergonomic keyboards. So I'm really excited to invite our guest speaker, Eric Trinkle. Um, Eric, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you. Great, yeah. Thanks, Octavia, and, and thanks, Prelude, for hosting. Um, so yeah, basically, a little bit off topic from the you know typical stuff you guys talk about in InfoSec, um, but I bet a lot of you use keyboards all the time. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about designing ergonomic keyboards and what I do over at Cyboard. Um, to make you know the most ergonomic keyboards, at least in my book. Um, so yeah, a little bit about about me uh, before we get too much into it. Uh, so I'm a biomedical engineer by training, and I worked in pharmaceuticals for a few years after college um, in cell therapy, doing cancer drugs and stuff like that. Um, and then you know throughout all that time, I was working on computers a lot, um, and you know getting chronic neck pain, shoulder pain, you know, stuff like that. And that's sort of what got me into ergonomic keyboards. Um, and then I decided to start Cyboard about two years ago uh, to sort of follow that that passion full time. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of how it came to, to be with Cyboard. Um, that's, that's me. But anyway, to start out, you know, talking about keyboards uh, and, and ergonomic keyboards, you got to sort of understand first normal keyboards and why you might want to think about getting something more ergonomic. Uh, so the, the keyboard that you're probably all very familiar with, with this QWERTY layout and the rows diagonally staggered from each other, uh, this is actually from 1878. This is a, a patent drawing here from a typewriter. Um, and the reason that, that they made it this way is because each key on the typewriter was connected to a mechanical arm that went up and had to hit the page. Um, and so in order to prevent those from crossing, they had to stagger these keys side to side. Um, not really the way your fingers move, but really works well for making a typewriter work. Um, another thing you may have heard if you've sort of gone down a little bit of this uh, history before is they specifically designed the QWERTY layout to slow down typists. But that's actually not quite the case. Um, again, because of these mechanical arms, they separated common two-letter combinations like TH and HE in the word the. Um, they separated those because if you press them and they were really close together and you press them fast, that could jam those mechanical arms uh, and then you'd actually end up being slower. So the, the reason that they did it in, in the 1800s was to actually make people faster so their typewriters wouldn't be jamming. But clearly today, that's a little awkward, and we don't need to worry about the mechanical arms jamming anymore. So, even though you know, even though that's the case, still most people are typing on these keyboards, mainly because they already know how to use it. Uh, so that's that's the biggest pro when you're thinking about traditional keyboards. There's no learning curve because you probably already learned how to use it in like elementary school. Um, and just by the way, everybody, you know, if there's any questions, please feel feel free to stop. We can go into more detail anywhere. I'm happy to do this more like a discussion or whatever. So, you know, if any questions come up, uh, Octavia, if you could just let me know, because I can't see the, the chat with the with this full screen on my monitor right now. Um, but anyway, so you already know how to use it. They're usually very cheap. Uh, you can buy something like this for maybe 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, but the issue comes in where, you know, it's not really been designed for a human hand. It was designed to make a typewriter work. Um, so, for some people, especially power users who are on their computer, you know, constantly, you have this potential for RSI, which is repetitive strain injury. Most popular one, or, or you know, most infamous one being being carpal tunnel. You'll hear a lot of people talk about that. Um, so that's that's not so great. And the other thing is, since this was sort of again built for typing English on paper, uh, it's not optimized for coding. You know, computers were not around at that time. Uh, so like things like the brackets and the numbers and symbols and all that are, are not really you know, optimized for, for their reach. So you usually have to either look down or like jump your hand over a little bit. It's not something that's very easy to touch type for everybody. 
And the last sort of thing that's, that's a con of the traditional keyboards is, in general, they're not very customizable or programmable, where a lot of the more modern keyboards are. Uh, and you can definitely get some traditional keyboards that are programmable, but the ergonomic ones tend to really you know, have that be a, a primary focus. So some, some of the things that can come up, uh, just to go a little bit more into the, the possible RSI and, and what sort of things we're trying to avoid when we try to design a keyboard to be more ergonomic, um, obviously, the, the carpal tunnel that we talked about before, that's sort of the most famous one. Um, these bones in your wrist here are the carpal bones, and then there's a ligament going across, and that all forms the, the carpal tunnel. And so through there, all of the tendons and nerves and, and you know, major arteries and blood vessels are going through. And so if you have your wrist in a, in a bent position, and then you're you know, moving those back and forth, you're sort of like sawing against the bones. Um, and that can eventually, over a long period of time, can start to cause some inflammation, which then, you know, crowds that space and then things got, start to get pressed on, you start to get pain and tingling and, you know, you can sort of lose a lot of your ability to, to work, especially if you're doing a typing intensive job, um, which probably most of you in the audience are. Another one that, that comes up tends to come up a little bit more with uh, overusing smartphones and, and or like gaming consoles and stuff like that. This one's called De Curvain Tenosynovitis. You might also have heard somebody talk about like texting thumb or gamer's thumb. Uh, and that's a very similar concept. You'll notice a theme with a lot of these RSI injuries is that uh, it's somewhere where a tendon is moving over something, you know, repeatedly for a long period of time and then eventually uh, gets swollen, and that, that's happening here on the outside of the wrist on the thumb side. And another couple more that, that can happen, again, same sort of thing, um, tendons rubbing when you're in, in a wrong posture or something like that, uh, cubital tunnel, which is sort of in your, in your funny bone, you have, again, more tendons and nerves running through there, uh, and if you're in an awkward position, hunched over, you know, your, your hands are way closer in than your shoulders and stuff like that, uh, then you can start to get pain down the outside of your arm and in the front of your chest and shoulder. Um, and that, that, that's for thoracic outlet syndrome here. Uh, and then this one is the cubital tunnel. But they're, they're sort of similar in the fact that you get pain on the side of your arm. The thoracic outlet one uh, is up. You know, that's the one that's farther up because you're, you you got tendons and nerves and stuff going through uh, near your neck uh, up here. Uh, and another one... Another really common one here is uh, this forward head posture, which comes a lot from if you especially have your monitor down a bit low, or if you're just on a, a single, you know, traditional keyboard and you have to sort of hunch over it uh, to, to be comfortable with it. It can sort of push your neck forwards, which then um, makes it so that there's a lot more leverage on your spine and it, and it causes the spine to curve too much. Um, and then you get sort of compression in between the, the vertebrae and you can get, and this is actually something that I, I definitely have and I've, I've worked to, to improve um, as part of my sort of ergonomics journey, um, but this can be pretty debilitating, like it can, it can start to make it really hard to turn your neck and stuff like that. Uh, so getting into a good posture when you're going to be spending, you know, eight plus hours a day working um, in that posture is definitely something worth considering for the, for the long term to avoid these, these pains. So that's sort of the, a few of the, the big bads uh, when you talk about, you know, different types of RSI that can come about from uh, office work and, you know, typing a lot and working on a computer constantly. Uh, and so before we get too far into the, you know, what we're going to do about uh, keyboards, um, the first thing you should do before you try to really optimize your keyboard is just make sure everything is sort of set up according to these best practices. Uh, and obviously these slides will all be available. I'm not going to like read all this out here, but one of the one of the biggest things I notice is sometimes people will work on a laptop as like their daily driver. Uh, I would really strongly recommend you either get an external monitor um, or put your laptop up on some some boxes so that it's up at your eye level, so you don't have to be hunching over it um, and use like an external keyboard and mouse. At the very least, you know, just sort of follow these. And then you can start to think about, you know, let's optimize the keyboard, get some, some awesome keyboard or something like that. Um, but these are sort of the basics that you should address first. So now we'll, we'll get into sort of the, the bulk of it. Um, and again, please stop me anytime if there's any question. Um, so some of the things you can do, um, 
when you're designing an ergonomic keyboard, you know, designing a keyboard that's that's meant for the person's hands and not just to make a typewriter work, um, is you can eliminate the the number pad and the navigation cluster. You can move those somewhere else, either to some sort of uh, secondary function layer in the keyboard or just an external module, and that'll help you not have to be having your wrist so far out to the side to, to reach the mouse. Um, and another thing uh, here is a lot of keyboards have this sort of positive angle and then no palm support or anything like that, so you can often, you know, sort of lax into this bent wrist posture. Um, and that can can sort of cause your your carpal tunnels to, to get inflamed. Uh, and one thing uh, about wrist rest, if you're if you're looking about getting a wrist rest in general, uh, it doesn't have to be for an ergonomic keyboard, just just anything in general. Um, I would say really they should be called palm rest because you don't want to be resting it on uh, on this you know soft area with all the tendons because then you're just again putting pressure on those tendons and you're you're basically just moving the carpal tunnel down here. Uh, and pressing on them here, so that's that's not great. Really, you should be trying when you're if you're going to be resting your hands while you're typing, uh, you should be supporting it on the outside of the heel of your hand in that green area there, because there's there's nothing going through there. It's just bones, um, so that's a much safer space to be if you're going to rest your hands while you're typing. The other thing you can do, of course, is just totally not have anything under your wrist, and you just have to remember to keep your keep your hands elevated like you're playing a piano, so you're just sort of floating your hands over the keyboard. And so here's sort of the, the big bang for your buck thing you can do, um, you know, with, with an ergonomic keyboard before you have to start relearning anything. Um, there are a few different models out there that are just sort of cut in half, and it's still a traditional layout, so you don't have to have any sort of new learning curve to, to deal with. So if you don't really feel like learning a new uh, keyboard, this is this is sort of the way to go. Because this will let you spread those out to your, your whole shoulder width. So you don't have to be bringing your wrists inside and, and you know hunching your shoulders over. So that's that's sort of like the big thing with ergonomic keyboards. One of the one of the biggest um, things to go for is just to get a split keyboard. Because um, that, that just really helps especially if you're having shoulder and neck pain, stuff like that, and to, to a lesser extent with the wrist, because you can then align each half to wherever is comfortable for you. And with that splitting, one of the other things that sort of gets unlocked is that you can now start to tent your keyboard or, or make the insides of it be higher than the outsides. And that, that'll just put your wrists into a more natural position. Um, Instead of sort of trying to plant them flat on a on a table, you're really over pronating there. Uh, if you get more into sort of a handshake position or just a, a t you know 15, 30 degree tilt, uh, that can be a lot more uh, comfortable once you get used to it. Uh, and I also do that for mice. You can get these vertical mice from a bunch of different sellers, uh, and that, that's just like a really quick and easy way. You don't really have to learn anything new, um, and you can sort of that can help a lot with with elbow issues and shoulder issues and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's to the end of the things that you don't have to like learn anything new. You don't have to relearn how to type. You don't have to do anything else. But now, when you start to really reimagine the keyboard and, and go back to, you know, what are we doing? We're, we're using our hands to, to press buttons, right? So we want to, now that we don't have to worry about those mechanical typewriter arms, it's opened up a huge design space. and and now you can you can just line stuff up and you can make things fit your fingers. So th this board here is called the Chocofy, and it is a open source PCB design. And you, so you can get this yourself um, and solder it up if you want to. Um, there's there's quite a few good guides on the internet about how to do that, and I'll, I'll link some good resources at the end as well. Um, but basically, you know, there's a whole bunch of these ergonomic keyboard designs now uh, where you can have your this is called a columnar stagger, so everything is in columns staggered instead of the traditional way of staggering the rows. Just again, because now you can have your your fingers be sort of the guide instead of the mechanical typewriter arms. And then sort of we're going up the pyramid of, of optimizing things, and um, the next thing to do is to sort of take it out of just optimizing it in a flat keyboard, and now you can start to do a 3D uh, curved keyboard 
And the big benefit of a, of a curved keyboard is that it, it sort of starts to really get more close, more similar to the, the way your hand actually moves. When you, when you take your hand in a palm and then you close it to a fist, your fingers don't move in like a straight plane. They, they move in a, in a sort of a spiral or it's close to a circle, um, circle motion. So then if you, if you put the keys closer to that motion, then there's, it's more natural to, to touch them and to press them. Um, so this keyboard on the right here is called the Dactyl Maniform. Um, and since 3D printing in the past decade or so has, has taken off, it's enabled a lot more people to start working on developing this stuff. Before that, there were a couple, um, a couple sort of niche um, but larger electronics man manufacturers like Kinesis and Maltron who have made concave keyboards like this for, for the ergonomics aspect, but they were very difficult to, to manufacture. Uh, and now with, with 3D printing um, being much more accessible, not only are they easier to manufacture, but also they're easier to actually test. You know, you, know, you can make prototypes really fast. You can figure out, because you have a lot of variables to, to work with, but if you can make prototypes quickly, then you can actually get through that and do real testing and not just be you know, imagining how it might feel and then trying to, to go to mass production. Um, the one downside of this is that, you know, with the exception of some specific uh, circuit boards that work in some cases, um, you generally, if you're doing this as like a DIY project, you're going to have to do a whole bunch of, you know, firstly 3D printing, um, which is a whole sort of hobby in itself, and then also hand wiring it by, you know, cutting up wires and attaching it to all the switches and stuff like that, uh, which can be you know, very time consuming and, and, and mainly tedious, not super difficult, but, but definitely, definitely tedious uh, if you're, if you're going to go hand wire this, especially if you're going to do it more than once. Um, so what, what we do uh, to sort of make that easier, it's still, still a bit of an involved process. Um, we have these, um, these flexible circuit boards, um, which, which help to uh, make it a little easier to, to build these things. Uh, and for us, since we're, we're working on, uh, you know, constantly changing the design and stuff like that, having it be really flexible lets us test a whole bunch of different things without needing to like get new circuit boards or without needing to, to hand wire. Um, and this is just a, a pretty cool looking build that we did recently for a customer uh, where they wanted it to be totally clear. And again, with, with 3D printing, that's, that's possible. It certainly would not be something you could really like machine out of glass or something like that, um, but it, it ended up looking really cool, at least in, in my opinion. Um, and you can sort of see you got the microcontroller in there, and then that, that plugs into the, the circuit board inside. Um, and then you plug in your, your switches into these, these holes at the end. Um, so, so yeah, that's how that one looks. Uh, and then so, so the next thing that, that we're doing at Cyboard specifically is uh, we've been working on doing a fully made-to-measure keyboard. Because now that, now that we're using 3D printing, um, Basically, there's there's not really a limitation that says we need to make the same keyboard for every customer. We can we can customize everything uh, for each person, and and the biggest gap there has been you know figuring out how to actually fit a keyboard to somebody's hand. So we've been spending a lot of time you know developing an algorithm and a hand model, um, so that we can take you know a photo of a hand with a credit card, and then we can take your your bank information and you know we can we can charge you that way. Not just kidding. <laughs> um, but but anyway, we, we use the credit card because it's a constant scale and it's something everybody pretty much has, even if they don't have a ruler lying around. Uh, so that can calibrate it. And then we can take all the anatomical measurements that we need to do and turn that into a keyboard. Um, so that, that's what we've been working on. That's sort of our, our, big, um, our big thing. And we're, we're calling it the imprint, at least for now. It's sort of in beta at the moment. Um, but, but it's very clearly inspired by the dactyl maniform and the kinesis and other other concave keyboards that came before, um, but now we're we're trying to actually make that personalized to the the customer. Um, so yeah, sort of just a little bit more about the design design philosophy there is that just basically no no one size fits all keyboard is really going to be optimal for an individual, and so we're trying to make it so that you can have a keyboard that's still at a decently affordable price, but but it's made actually for your hands. So that, that's, um, that's the big thing for us with the imprint. Um, and a couple of the sort of smaller tweaks that we made to, uh, to the dactyl, like as compared to the dactyl maniform keyboard, 
uh, so in that one, the, the keys are all in sort of a circle, um, but we've built it based on the hand's natural motion, which is more like a spiral shape, of, like sort of like a Fibonacci sequence. It's pretty close to that. And it, of course, depends on the length of the joints and things like that. Um, but anyway, we, we have that sort of spiral thing going. And then one other issue that sometimes comes up uh, with some of these thumb cluster designs is you'll end up with a little bit too much of like a pinching motion, more similar to a um, like a game controller or something like that, depending on your hand size. So for example, if you have a small hand and you're going to be trying to use this dactyl maniform keyboard, uh, you can start to end up doing a bit more of a pinching motion and that can for some people you know it can increase their chance of getting that texter's thumb issue um, so in order to avoid that uh, on ours we're trying to use a more flat um, an arc shaped um, thumb cluster so that you're doing a motion that's a sort of a sideways clubbing with your thumb uh, and that that's much more similar to what you're used to on a, on a space bar and you can save all your bent thumb presses for your smartphone when you're texting and stuff like that. You know, you don't need to be doing that motion on your smartphone and also on your computer because then you're, then you're probably using that motion constantly. Uh, so that's not great. Uh, so th those are some of the some of the optimizations that we've made. Uh, and I just want to show a quick video of like what does it actually look like to to type on something like this. And so here's here's a video of me doing it on mine. And this is on the uh, monkey type website. I'm just doing like a typing test and have the like numbers and punctuation turned on. And you can sort of see that as I'm typing, I don't really have to move my hand very much. I keep my outside of my heel of my hand anchored down on the palm rest. And then I'm just, I can just reach the number row very easily, um, which has been great for me. So yeah, that, that's that. And then, and so after that, you know, we're, we're mostly just going to talk about other keyboard stuff. Um, but this is this is what we're doing specifically at Cyborg. Um, so a little bit about the hardware and the firmware in these keyboards, these these DIY keyboards, and and all these all these ergonomic keyboards that have sort of been been popping up in the past ten years, especially with three D printing and more affordable um, printed circuit board solutions. Um, you know, a lot of people have been getting into design. Um, and this QMK firmware uh, is an open source firmware that's really powerful. There's, there's lots of really great features that, that let you customize your workflow and your keyboard to, to do pretty much anything you want. Um, you, can, you can write, you know, your own advanced C uh, routines if you want to into the firmware. You can make basically unlimited macros and combos and you know, people are experimenting with all sorts of different layouts and everything, uh, and it's all been enabled by the, the QMK firmware. And there are a couple other firmwares out there, like there's one called uh, ZMK, which is optimized for Bluetooth. Um, so that one's pretty cool too. Um, and that Chalkify keyboard I showed earlier was was using that that firmware to, to be a Bluetooth split with, with no wires anywhere. So that, that's that's pretty cool too. Um, well, for, like just basically the QMK one is, is the big one. Uh, and recently it's all sort of changed over from using some weaker chips to now people have put so many features on that, that now we sort of need to use whole computers in our keyboards. So we're using Raspberry Pis uh, in the keyboards. And that, you know, not, not to be 100% off topic for today, you know, that opens up potentially a bit more of a larger attack surface for as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Not that I know a ton about that, but you know, you could definitely imagine somebody writing some sort of keylogger that you know maybe checks and sees if you have a QMK uh, keyboard and, and finds some vulnerability there. So having this you know really powerful keyboard um, could potentially open up some more some more issues from a security standpoint. And you know, if you guys have any ideas about that, I would I would be interested to hear as well, of course, because you know uh, I'm not the expert there, but but I think it would be definitely something to consider um, in the future. So, so yeah, that, that's the, um, the hardware and the firmware side of things. Um, and if you don't want to, you know, get super into the weeds and, and get compiling locally, there's a lot of uh, keyboards that come with uh, uh, Vial, which is an app uh, that lets you just instantly in a GUI change things, like record macros, 
uh, and it just stores it right onto your, your keyboard. Um, so this is how that, that app looks. Um, and basically, you know, if I wanted to change a function of something, let's say I want to turn Q into plus, I could just click on Q, click on plus, and then it's, it's changed. So, and you can record macros, you can change your RGB lighting, you can set up tap dancing, which is uh, a feature where you, depending on how many times you press something, it might do a different function. You can set up combos and, you know, all sorts of different stuff here. So it's, it's really useful. Uh, and if you do run into like the, the ceiling of what you can customize, in file, then you can always go back to the source, QMK, write your own code, uh, and then you end up, you know, compiling it and flashing it, which is a little bit less um, convenient, but, you know, you can really, really customize, like, the exact thing you want uh, if you're willing to put the effort in. Another cool thing with the firmware is it's starting to allow now um, other things that aren't just keyboards. Like for example, this one on the right here is one of our prototypes where we're trying to add in a trackball. And there's a couple other uh, keyboards out there with trackballs built into them now, which is really cool. Um, helps you not, you know, have to go reach over for your mouse when you're just doing small things, you don't have to go back and forth. So that's pretty cool. Um, and there's other stuff like track points and scroll wheels and, you know, side switches and OLED screens. You can even add speakers and play songs and stuff like that. There's just like a, a ton of things you can do uh, with the, with firmware that's that's out now with like QMK and CMK and KMK. Um, so, so yeah, th this keyboard, by the way, is the Santoku uh, by Gestalt Input, which is a really cool one with this um, track point there, which is not as common. So it's a, it's a cool one if you're looking for that. So yeah, that, that's sort of the meat of it uh, as far as what I want to, to go through about, you know, just sort of introducing everybody to ergonomic keyboard stuff. Um, and just here are some useful links. Um, if you are interested and you want to get more into it uh, for the future, you know, buy your own or, or build your own. Um, there's the Reddit, which is ergonomic keyboards. There's a ton of people in there, always very helpful. Tons of really awesome designs, like constantly getting posted. Lots and lots of people in the community innovating. And then if you want to, um, if you're thinking about this, but you don't really want to commit to something, you know, before you try it, at least for the flat keyboards, you can use this compare.splitkp.com website. And that lets you take a look at, at how the keyboard is laid out and you can print it on paper and, and you can like feel um, with your hands, you know, how far the reaches are and if, it, if you think it's going to be comfortable for you. So that's really cool. It doesn't work for like the dactyls and the, the curved keyboards. Uh, sort of for obvious reasons, you can't you can't print those out on paper, um, but it's really fantastic for the for the flatter boards. Um, there's also this uh, magazine called KBD News, and they put out a lot of awesome content. They do like a weekly digest, um, focus on like DIY keyboards, uh, and they also have a big uh, database of all the different vendors of keyboards, especially small vendors like us. Um, and not only that, but if you're if you're looking around, you can you can sort of search and filter it by you know your region. If you're in the EU or you know South America, whatever, you can filter it that way. And the other good thing, especially if you're looking to buy or buy components or whatever, is most vendors on there uh, have some sort of coupon, so you get a get a discount if you if you just check out their links on KBD News. So don't forget about that if you're going down the road. And if you're trying to get into um, designing your own circuit boards and stuff like that, um, one thing that can sort of be a, a force multiplier there is this ErgoGen, um, which is a tool that lets you build uh, PCBs just based on, you know, you can say, oh, my, my I want to have the, this column is like four millimeters higher than this one. I, I've, I've measured my hands. I now I think I know where I want things to be. And, and you can put in a bunch of inputs into ErgoGen and it'll spit out a, a PCB and like different plate files and stuff like that so that you can get it all manufactured pretty easily and, and relatively cheaply usually. And then of course we're always happy to to talk in our Discord and, and about uh, about ergonomic keyboards whether you're building your own or a wearable or whatever we're always happy to talk about this stuff. Uh, so that's our website and that's our Discord if you guys are interested in, in learning more about what we're doing. Um, so yeah that, that's it for for me, and I'm obviously very happy to, to stay around and, and talk more if anybody has questions, stuff like that. Uh, I just want to thank Prelude again for having us um, and thank all you for coming and listening. Um, 
if, you would, if you're interested in anything from Cyboard, always welcome to use this uh, Prelude discount code, 20 bucks off um, anytime. So really appreciate it, and thanks a lot, guys. Cool. Um, that was awesome, Eric. Thank you so much for, for taking the time yeah, to join of us. Um, let me just open up the chat. We'll see if we have some questions for you. Um, two questions. So the first one is about how much does it take your average user to adapt to an ergonomic keyboard? Um, so mm. if you, yeah, I mean, you can take yeah. a shot at that. And I have opinions too, um, actually. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so for me specifically, I started out on a flat keyboard like that, um, similar to that Chalkify that I showed earlier. Um, and it took me about three weeks. And I did that with blank keyboards, with blank keycaps with no labels. Um, so that, yeah, that, that was uh, a bit, bit you know, it took basically three weeks and then I was back to feeling totally comfortable and starting to feel like, you know, um, it was a little bit, you know, different when I went back to a QWERTY keyboard. You know, I could still type on it just fine, but like I definitely noticed the difference between the two. Um, and I'd say some, like I had one customer last week who, uh, he was already back up to like his top speed of like 120 words a minute after like a couple days on the keyboard. And he, he was just switching from, from something else. So, so yeah, it, it sort of varies. It seems like it's, you know, within a month at the tops, you should be starting to get used to it uh, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was my experience. I mean, um, I have a, one of the, uh, cyborg keyboards. I bought a dactyl menu for him and, um, the first day or two, it was brutal. Um, I was typing like five words per minute, and then within two weeks, I, I was back to normal. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, the, the board is it's amazing. It's super comfortable. Um, awesome. Yeah. Glad so there's some. There's a second question. Um, is there any significant difference from an ergonomics point of view um, between wired and wireless keyboards? Um. I would say not really, as long as your cable that connects the two halves of the keyboard is long enough. Um, that's the one thing. Some of the um, some of the ergonomic keyboards that you can get on like Amazon or something like that, they'll have like a five or six inch uh, cable, which if you have wide shoulders, that's that's not going to be wide enough for you. Uh, and a lot of times they'll actually be molded in for for the cheaper ones. Um, whereas like. For, for ours and for a lot of others, you'll either have like an audio cable or like a phone cable like we have, or um, or even like a USB-C cable. And then, you know, you can have that pretty much as long as you want. Um, but yeah, with wireless, uh, the one thing that is sort of nice is you don't have the wires, obviously. So a lot of people will uh, like mount it on their chair. And that's that gets a little bit more awkward when you're trying to do a wired build. Um, but yeah, we, we've done a few uh, Bluetooth ones and they're not not particularly more difficult to, to make. Uh, you, there's not quite as many features in the uh, ZMK firmware as compared to QMK, but they're always getting there and it's a, it's a really clean, um, clean build. Um, but just due to like some uh, sort of licensing stuff with, with the Bluetooth chips, uh, they can't like really share with QMK. So it's sort of a total clean room, separate environment from, from QMK, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, so basically if you want to put it on your chair or like make it sort of more wearable or something like that, then definitely, um, definitely wireless is great. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's sort of, sort of niche, niche cases where it would matter for ergonomics. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, again, I started with something more similar to like a flat, similar to a Moonlander, but a bit smaller, um, like basically a corn keyboard, if you've heard of that one. Um, and I personally didn't like the, how few keys were on it. And, and with the Moonlander, you do have the, the number row. Um, but the main thing that I find with the, the curvature of the Manuform, and, and even more so with the imprint, which is a bit more aggressive, um, is that you, know, you, can, you can much more easily touch type that, that number row. Um, whereas on a, at least if you have medium or small hands on a Moonlander, it's probably gonna be that you need to move your whole hand or move your arm a little bit to, to reach the number row. Um, maybe that's not the case for you, but, but anyway, it's generally the, 
the optimization of, of curving it so that everything is a, a bit closer together uh, and also in sort of the natural spot where your hand is going to reach anyway. Um, it helps, uh, you know, with, with touch typing the farther away things. And like for, for me, not that I necessarily need to do it constantly, but I do do it quite a bit when I'm using CAD programs and stuff like that. Uh, just having, being able to touch type the function row without moving my hand is, is pretty nice because, you know, then I, I just have that whole extra row that I, I don't need to, you know, look down. And it, basically it's more like helping with optimizing the workflow. So you um you shared a bunch of resources at the end of your talk, um, links to like the Ergo Mechanical Reddit and um, the KBD Magazine, I think it was, and some others. Um, yeah. For folks that are kind of getting started in the space that want to go out and maybe build their own keyboard, um, either from scratch or to maybe try and prototype and design something uh, new, how do you recommend they get started? Are there beginner builds that um, might be interesting yeah. to someone or should they just go out and like, you know, ex experiment? What, what do you, what do you recommend? Yeah. So I would say um, if you go on to that uh, compare.splitkb.com thing, actually I can, I can pull it up uh, right here. And this, this is going to be for the, uh, the flat keyboards, of course. Um, but let me, I'll share my screen again and then sort of give you a little demo of how that, how that works. Um, so th this would be a sort of a good way for you to, um, to look at how these things work and you can, you can compare some of these different popular ones and it'll, it'll load it and it'll superimpose the different designs. So you can get a sort of a sense of, of how they're going to be different from each other. Um, and then for a lot of these, you can just sort of search around and find some kits. And they'll, they'll, there'll be some, you know, um, storefronts that'll have, um, they'll sell you basically all of the, the parts. Like, for example, splitkb.com, who, who hosts this. They have a bunch of different keyboard kits that are really user-friendly, and they're based in the EU. So if you guys are EU-based, uh, that, that's a really great store. Uh, and basically, you can get all the parts you need. Uh, and they have good guides and stuff like that, so you can, you know, solder it yourself and, and you know, learn how that works. And I would recommend doing that first before you try to uh, get into like designing your own entirely from scratch, because there's just uh, so many different uh, things that go into it. Like if you want to design circuit boards, you got to figure out, you know, how you're going to do that. You have to you have to learn that software for that design. And if you want to build a case, you got to learn the CAD, and you probably have to learn some 3D printing or or you know, laser cutting stuff, or you know, whatever you might have to do. There's, there's a lot of different directions you can go. But if you learn how to build one, you know, you can sort of see everything uh, from the, you know, from a kit that's already known to work, and make sure that's all good. And then maybe if you don't, maybe you like it. Maybe you don't need to go any further. Maybe you want to keep optimizing and you want to go, you know, farther down the rabbit hole, as they say. Um, and then you know, you you might get into designing your own join us in the in the ergomech keyboard uh reddit and you know share your your new designs and stuff like that um so yeah that's that would be my recommendation question for you actually so you sure, mentioned yeah. um the vial.rocks software which um in case anyone mm -hmm. missed it it's like a configuration software for programming um keystrokes and, and whatever on your keyboard. Um, does it also allow you to flash firmware or is that not uh, not supported? So that, um, it doesn't really. Uh, so basically, if you wanted to flash firmware, there's a different process uh, where you would go through, through QMK. I think that actually is sort of partially related to the security uh, aspect of it. And they, they do have, um, I guess, yeah, I'll, sh I'll share my screen again and pull up Vial. Um, uh, da -da. So, so they have this um, security feature. So, for example, if you want to do something like look at which keys are being pressed constantly, which is what this matrix tester does, uh, first thing you need to do is, is unlock it, which requires you to physically press uh, a combination of keys that you define for a while first before you unlock it. And I suppose at this point, 
it is basically unlocked enough that you could flash firmware, but it's as far as I know, it's not going to let you do that um, through Vile. So you would have to do like a, a new build and then flash. Okay, something to... Uh, as a security researcher, that's something to poke at, I guess. That's where I was going with that. Um, mm, yeah. Interesting, thanks. Um, so we're actually kind of running up on time uh, for today's session. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, so I'd just like to thank you for your time once again. Um, it's been really interesting watching you uh, come out and speak. Um, I actually learned a lot about better posture. I think uh, I have some take homes for how I sit in my chair. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's the thing. A lot of times it is very, um, you know, interesting to get into like optimize, especially us, you know, we're, we're programmers, we're engineers, you know, we want to optimize the object, but you, you got to remember that you're the, you're really the, the thing that needs to be optimized, like your body mm -hmm. is, is the most important. So there's a, a sort of a, a good phrase that like, the most ergonomic position you can be in is is the next one so like make sure you're still moving around like even though your keyboard might be optimized to reduce your movement while you're typing doesn't mean you shouldn't you should just sit there all day and never move like you should you know stand go walk around you know do things like that because that'll really help a lot too I, I love i love that i will remember to go go out and touch grass that's yes yeah that's that's, that's always good to do <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so yeah been super fun um Eric, thank you once again. I'm going to end the recording. Um, any final words awesome. before, we, before I let you go here? No, yeah, sounds good. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah.